We are going to go ahead and uh, get started. I'm Gina Boss, Deputy Director for the Center for Transportation Studies. And on behalf of CTS, we want to welcome you to today's All Councils meeting, Rural Needs Statewide Answers, Demographics, Healthcare Access, and Community Engagement. So today's meeting is sponsored by the five CTS councils. So we have four research councils listed up here, as well as our education and engagement council. And each May, in conjunction with the CTS annual meeting and awards luncheon, we like to host a, a meeting where all council members and friends can gather uh, on topics that are cross-cutting and would be of interest. And we thought today was a perfect uh, example of a cross-cutting topic. If you're interested and you're not already a member or a friend of one of the CTS uh, councils, feel free to go to our website and uh, sign up and learn more about the councils and how you can become involved with them. So CTS is, the, is sort of the, um, I would say, the focal point for transportation research, education, and engagement here at the University of Minnesota. And we are uh, pleased to sort of be that connector between people who have interests in uh, transportation-related topics and the expertise that we have here at the University of Minnesota. We also obviously support uh, students in their work and studies here at the university, as well as foster um, engagement and uh, continuing education for professionals in the, uh, in the workforce, transportation workforce. So a few housekeeping items. Um, there are two all-gender single, single stall restrooms where are, are located. You go out these uh, doors, take a right, and they're, they're just down the hall. Um, there are other restrooms that are further, again, you can either go left or right and back towards the elevators and uh, you'll, you'll find the restrooms there. So today we're going to be talking about um, three topics that are related to uh, rural need, the rural needs and statewide answers. So first of all, we're going to talk or hear about some of the changing demographics in Minnesota and what that means as we plan for, uh, for the future of the state and our, uh, our residents. Then we're going to hear um, about some innovative work that's going on in other parts of the country um, in terms of making sure that um, residents have access to transportation that allows them to access services. So we'll hear a little bit from our um, speaker, Valor Valerie Leffler, on that. And then uh, our final presentation today will be from um, Dr. Nicole Morris, who is going to talk about uh, some community engagement work that she's been doing as it uh, relates to infrastructure changes and um, safety. So as part of, in a, uh, part of today, we also want to involve all of you. So yes, you are going to be getting involved and we'll explain a little bit more about what that looks like um, as we get further into the program. So I'm going to go ahead and move us along. As you can see, we uh, want to make sure we have plenty of time for discussion um, and for our presentations. Uh, one more thing I will mention before we jump into that is that the CTS Research Conference is scheduled for November 7th. It's actually going to be this year right here in uh, the McNamara Alumni Center. So we uh, look forward to seeing you in November. And with that, uh, please let me introduce our first speaker. So Eric Guthrie is a senior demographer in the Minnesota State Dem Demographic Center. He came to the Demographic Center in May 2021, following time spent managing the South Dakota Rural Life and Census Data Center and serving as the state demographer in Michigan. Throughout his career, Eric has always found the greatest fulfillment in using demographic knowledge and techniques to help others better understand the world in which we live and work. This has led to countless presentations ranging from, uh, ranging from local township meetings to legislative testimony. Please uh, join me in welcoming Eric. Um, so thank you for uh, inviting me. I really enjoy coming and talking about these, um, uh, the, the, these data. Um, and the topic is, is particularly uh, important right now as we t talk about the way that Minnesota is changing in terms of the demographic composition. 
I did not do anything. Um, <laughs> anyway, uh, there we go, perfect, okay. So um, all of the data that I'm gonna show you today are publicly available, there's nothing that is um, behind any closed walls. So if you find something that I'm talking about interesting and you want to look at the uh, analysis for your particular area, we can certainly do that. Uh, my contact information is at the end of the presentation. I uh, enjoy taking questions as I go. Um, however, today I have more slides than minutes, so um, what we're going to do is let me get through the kind of base setting stuff, and then once I get into the, the important stuff about what, what I've come here to talk about, uh, you can interrupt me at that point, um, and then we can, we can go. But um, let me get through the 2020 census stuff and then that kind of base setting um, um, stuff. Okay, so the topics I'm gonna talk about today, as I mentioned, the 2020 census, uh, how populations change, kind of a general topic, and then uh, what Minnesota can expect based on that. Diversity is a long-term trend. Uh, that's a really important topic, something that has come up in, um, as a result of some of the data that have been release, released through the 2020 census. And it's particularly important when we talk about how our rural areas are changing and what we can expect as we move into the future. Okay, and then we need to talk about aging. Um, the center, my grounding um, uh, premise for creating this presentation was focusing on rural areas and there is no topic more important um, in, when discussing rural demographics than talking about the aging of the population. Okay, so some grounding questions that I was given um, for, for the presentation. Um, in your view, how uh, will changing demographics in Minnesota, especially rural Minnesota, impact the residents' uh, transportation needs? This is a, is a very important question, and um, we're going to get into that in a couple different ways uh, in the data that I'm going to show you. Um, what's the demographic composition going to look like as we move forward? Also, uh, very important, and while you know, I can't tell you, I, I don't make predictions, right? I, I, I'm, a, I'm a sociologist, I, I, I operate on, on the basis of data and what I can likely see in the future. If you want somebody to come and give you a, a prediction, ask an economist, they're always more confident in what they talk about. Um, I, I, I do projections, not, not uh, uh, forecasts or anything like that. Um, and that what are the consequences of our changing demographics? That is an extremely important topic. Um, and um, one that is going to create some very specific challenges and, um, and, and provide some very specific opportunities as we, as we move forward, okay? Wonderful. So the 2020 census, um, we spend billions of dollars every 10 years to do a count of the population. Um, those data are still rolling out. We expect to see the end of the 2020 census data releases this summer, um, but let's go through what we have seen so far from these data. Um, the 2020 data point here is the last point on this line, and we can see it's also the highest point on this line. So as we move forward, we have seen and expect to see into the future continuing increases in the population. As we move forward, the slope of this line is not going to be as strong as it has been previously, but we do expect to, con to continue to see population growth as we move forward. That population growth is going to be uneven across different segments of our population and across different areas of the state, but overall we do expect to see continued increase by increases in population. And if you're interested in breaking these down um, into a, at a more down to basically at the county level, we are about to produ uh, produce and publish a new set of projections um, and those should be coming online on our website within the next few weeks. These are based on our previous project, our, these are actually uh, historical data, so. No projection. The 2020 census data, um, when we look across nearly all of the groups, um, either under 18 or over to 18 from 2010 to 2020, we can see that we have generally seen population increases. There's one specific group in this table uh, that did not see population increases. Were you my students and we were in a classroom, I'd sit here until you could figure out which one it is. You're not my students, so I'm not gonna make you do that. It's the um, Persons who identify uh, as white who are under 18 years of age, that population from 2010 to 2020 got smaller. Now, we do not, we are not saying that we necessarily saw some mass exodus of this population. They didn't necessarily move out, though um, there is some uh, strong trends in college age migration that, that we could talk about. But largely what we're seeing here as a result is the result of declining fertility um, in, in, the, in, the, in the population group that identifies as white. Overall, the white population from 2010 to 2020 uh, decreased as well. So the, the, the group as a whole also declined. It is the only group that declined from 2010 to 2020, um, which 
you know, by extension, uh, we, we can see that the state is becoming more and more diverse. It's evident in the data. Uh, what I'm going to show you a little later is that that is not a recent phenomenon. It's actually something that we have seen in Minnesota for at least the last 30 years. Okay. So where is population growing and where is population shrinking in the state? Well, again, from the 2020 census data, we can see that when we look at uh, counties with population increase, generally those counties run in a line from um, northwest Minnesota to southeast uh, Minnesota. We see this strong um, population both in terms of uh, total concentration and in terms of the um, growth in particular areas. Now, there are, of course, exceptions. There are, uh, of course, counties that have increased that aren't necessarily in that um, corridor, but largely that is where we are seeing the strongest population growth in the state. So when we look at these counties, nearly three-quarters of the population growth between 2010 and 2020 was in the metropolitan area. Um, Hennepin, Ramsey, Dakota counties grew by a combined of over 185,000 residents, so quite considerable growth between 2010 and 2020. Um, the growth in the state was sufficient to maintain our congressional representation just barely. Um, so as we move forward, that is going to be something that we need to think about in terms of not only do we need to maintain population growth, but we need to, to maintain sufficient population growth to maintain our voice nationally. <clears throat> Also, uh, Wright, Olmsted, and Stearns counties rounded out the top 10 for uh, population increases from the 2020 census. So the opposite of this, right? So when we're looking at pop places that where population increases, we also have, are going to have pop where, bleh, words, right? Where populations have declined. Um, there was no county in Minnesota that stayed exactly the same. And that would be extremely odd if we, if we did have one, but um, what we see is the, as I said, the opposite. So when we look at places with population decline, it's outside the center of the state. It's around the periphery of the state, along the North and South Dakota borders, along the Iowa border, um, not so much along the Wisconsin border, you know, the Scotties, what are we gonna do with those, right, you know? But um, regardless, we see a general uh, area of population decline around um, the um, periphery of the state in our more sparsely populated areas of the state. We're, we're seeing general population decline. Okay, Kuchting, uh, Renville, Martin County, and St. Louis counties, each loss in excess of 1,200 people. 1,200 people over 10 years doesn't sound like a lot of people, but it is when we talk about places that are relatively small to begin with. St. Louis County might be the exception in this group with uh, Duluth being, being part of that county, but still uh, considerable population loss uh, over the period. The average loss for counties that lost population, not just those counties that I mentioned in the previous bullet, but the average loss for counties that lost population was 543, and the average loss was just over 4%. Okay, so moving along. How populations change, right? So when we think about how populations change, there are only three factors that change a population. And I gotta tell you, when I started grad school, my advisor said, you're gonna be studying three things. I thought, hot damn, I can do this. I picked the right major until I figured out what those three things were and how complex the topics are, right? So the three things that can change population size are births, deaths, and migration. Think about the complexities of studying each one of those. Each one of those is <laughs> multiple careers right? uh, in, in, in academic life. Okay. This we can turn into a very simple formula that really serves as the basis for my entire discipline. I love simplicity, and again, I thought I can do this. Population at time two, so let's say 2020, right, is equal to the population at time one, let's say 2010, plus the births that occurred over the period, minus the deaths that occurred over the period, and plus the interaction of in and out migration that occurred over the period. So what we're talking about here is the interaction of natural change in the population and net migration. We can further break down net migration into domestic versus international, interstate versus um, interstate, and those sorts of things. But ultimately, when we're talking about a population, we're talking about the change as a result of the combination of the ins and the outs, right? That is our net. So this is always going to be how populations change, no matter where we're talking about and no matter the circumstances for, those, for that change. It's going to be a combination of birth, deaths, and migration. Over the last... Um, 30 years, we can see that Minnesota's um, trends in births and deaths have been relatively stable, right? 
relatively flat over the period, although we can see in the more recent years they're beginning to converge, right? As those lines begin to converge, they're going to begin to approach zero. The difference between them is going to begin to approach zero. That is the dotted line, right? We can see a definite downward slope in that natural change line that is going to hit zero probably sometime this decade for the state or early in the next decade. Many counties in the state are already at the point where their natural increase is uh, either at or below zero. An interesting note here uh, also is the um, light blue line that represents the net migration. We can see that, that line is much more, we'll call it dynamic, right? It, it, it moves a lot more. It is much more subject to um, policy changes, much more subject to um, things that are happening in the moment, right? We can also see that there are long-term trends in it as well. We can see there was a significant level shift between the um, 1990s and the, and the beginning of the 2000s. Our overall net migration declined significantly and remained um, at a depressed rate, or um, a lower rate, shall we say, um, starting in around 2000. We have mostly seen positive net migration with a few points um, uh, in there that have uh, uh, dipped into the negative net migration. When we have positive net migration, that is almost, I'm, I'm gonna decompose some of the last years later on in the presentation, but nearly every year where we've seen positive net migration, it has been because our international migration has um, made up for losses in domestic migration. Okay, so we are becoming a much more diverse state because we are growing through our international migrants. That is really the avenue for Minnesota's population growth. If population growth is necessary for the state and the state's economy, as many contend, then international migration is going to be absolutely vital um, to focus on in terms of a way for the state to grow its population. These, the dotted lines here are projections. These, these are not the projections that we are going to publish. These are our most recent published projections. We can see that both lines have a positive slope. Both lines are increasing. The under uh, 18 line looks very flat. It does have a slight positive um, slope to it as well. Um, the over 18 line um, is, is relatively uh, consistent in, in, in the increases that we expect to see. Um, through about 2055. A lot of the changes that we're going to need to understand are directly related to the population structure. There's a population pyramid. It represents the population structure that we saw in 1990. We can see a very large bulge between 25 and 45. That is our baby boomer population. As we set the graphic in motion, we can see that population begin to move up. And around 2000 and, well, I've got to wait for it. I'm getting a little ahead of myself. One, two, three. Around 2010, we can see the baby boom population start to cross the 65-year mark, right? Not everybody who turns 65 immediately says, I'm retiring. I will, but I am not everybody. Um, when, we, when we see that cross against, the uh, words. When we see people cross that 65-year mark, what we're seeing is a higher probability that those individuals will begin to exit the labor force, right? As they get further and further from 65, that probability of exiting the labor force increases uh, up to 100% at some point. But um, what we can also see from the structure is that the generation behind the baby boom generation is smaller, right? So there's going to be a deficit in the labor force. And what we're seeing right now with our labor force shortages is a direct result of the population structure of the state, right? We have an, a large bulge of our population beginning to exit the labor force and fewer people coming behind them to replace them. Okay, so again, we, we, we can't, um, uh, I'm trying to find the right word, we can't, we can't, natural increase is not gonna solve this problem for us, right? Now, even if our fertility were sufficient um, to potentially solve the problem, it would take 18 to 25 years for them to begin to, to, begin to um, affect our current labor force issues. Okay, so when we look at, when we think about some of the labor force and aging issues in our state, um, the consequences of them are directly related to the structure of our population. How, what proportion of our populations 
are um, represented by particular generations and age groups. Okay. We are already at the point where we likely have more persons over 65 years of age than we have um, in the school age population. That is going to create um, challenges in terms of determining funding levels for various programs. There will be a bit of a uh, tension between, say, for example, elder care and education, um, especially in our more sparsely populated areas where this reality has already been seen for, for a number of years in many areas. Okay. Diversity is a long-term trend. I am through my base setting stuff, so if anybody has any questions, you're, you're welcome to, to interrupt me. But again, more slides than minutes, so here we go. Um, this is one of my favorite graphics, and I show it to everybody because I love it. Okay? Uh, what we're looking at here is the share of the population represented by these groups from 1990 to 2020. And why I really love this graphic is because of the, some of the news stories that we saw after the 2020 census, right? Some of those news stories were <laughs> gushing, <laughs> almost, about the diversity in Minnesota, and, and, and as they should be. But a lot of them kind of missed a little bit of the point that this is not a, a, a new phenomenon, right? The 2020 census collected data in a way that helped to highlight this phenomenon, but it is something that we have seen and are, have been seeing in the data for, for quite a while. You know, we can look at our, our top three um, um, communities of color in the state, our African-American population, our Hispanic or Latino population, and our um, uh, Asian-American population, and can see that those populations, you know, have more than doubled over the last 30 years. Significant increases, and we expect that, and we hope that that trend will continue as we move into the future because without our communities of color, uh, our state would have shrunk sent, um, between the 2010 and 2020 census. They are 100% responsible for our population increases. So if, and the only lines that don't look like they're increasing are our <laughs> lines for our Native American populations. They have, a, um, have had a relatively small change over the period, so it makes the lines look flat in comparison to the other groups, but there is a positive slope to those lines. They have been increasing um, over this entire period. So if we talk about every other group as having increased as a share of the total population, the only thing mathematically that can happen to the remainder group is decline, right? So when we look at the group that identifies as white, we can see since 1990 there have been, has been a, a bit of a decline in that population. Uh, in 1990, the state um, was around 95% or so white, and now we are looking at a little under 80%. Okay, so significant change over the period. And a lot of folks think that that change is concentrate, well, is solely a, a function of the Twin Cities and the metro area. It's not, right? We, we see these um, communities of color um, throughout the state um, contributing and thriving. Uh, in various ways. Okay, so just to highlight this point one more time, right, we have this population structure in 1990 again with the, our communities of color highlighted in orange and yellow, okay? If we advance this to 2020, we can see the drastic increase in terms of share of the population. Something also that is, does this have a pointer on it? That's the button. Yeah, boom, no bar. Okay, so we can see here that the, the white population has a, a narrowing base, indicative of fertility decline and declining fertility, whereas when we look at the general population, but for something very recently in the under five population, we can see a relatively stable population. Um, actually, because of the declining white population, were we to look at the communities of color um, in isolation, they would have a, they would have a widening base because their, their fertility rate is above two. Okay. So I, I told you I was gonna decompose migration a little bit. Um, this highlights the point that primarily in most years when we're looking at positive migration, uh, we're looking at um, our losses to domestic migration being offset by our gains through international migration. The exception uh, are a few years right here where we had um, positive domestic migration, 
I know that the question is going to be, well, what caused that? I don't know. We're kind of looking at that, and we're trying to figure out what are some of the determinants in that, perhaps um, some of the um, data elements that we're changing. We're, we're investigating that, and we're taking a look at it. We're not quite positive. Um, some other interesting points, we saw a big decline, a big out-migration in 2022. A variety of, of, we're also kind of looking at that. Um, one of my pet theories that I do not have data to back up at this point is that we are seeing some delayed out migration for college age populations that didn't happen in 20 and 2021 as people perhaps stayed in Minnesota for their first and second years of school or delayed <laughs> entry into school or something like that. That's my pet theory that I'm working on, but I'm not sure at this point. But the broader point is, is how important international migration is to population change and population growth in the state. When we think about our international migrants, it's important to understand where these populations um, are coming from because these are the people that are going to be coming, these are going to be our new Minnesotans uh, entering our communities and helping to um, revitalize some areas and, and strengthen others. So I can see that the largest group coming in is our, is our Mexican population followed by um, populations from Somalia, India, Ethiopia, Thailand. Um, what we're looking at uh, broadly and generally is uh, a large amount of migration from uh, persons who identify as Hispanic, uh, persons who um, identify as, uh, or who um, originate from um, Africa and um, South Asia as well. So those, those are some of the larger sending countries for our, um, for our migration, migrant populations. I want to look at um, our Hispanic migrants because of these because of the size of the population, how important they are in terms of our um, more rural areas and population growth in general. So uh, we looked at our top groups. The top group was our, our Mexican immigrants, our, our people who originate from Mexico. But we can see that when we look at our foreign-born population that identifies Hispanic or Latino, that they represent um, less than half of that population. So when we think about the immigration of persons our Hispanic and Latino immigrants are our largest group, broadly speaking. They're also interesting in that, and I, I don't have the, the, the slides in this presentation because of the time limitations, but they're also a very interesting population because they tend to spread out more across the state. They do not tend to concentrate in the Twin City or our, or our small cities and towns in the same way that other populations do. And there are a variety of reasons for that. We can talk about that more if you're interested, but I need to move along. Aging, right? Vital population topic when we think about uh, our rural areas. Again, the population pyramid for, for 2020 as kind of a base setting. Remember that large um, population moving across the 65 year mark. Our this is causing increasing median age. When we think about median age at the county level, that is not evenly distributed across the state. Okay, when we look at median age across the state, what we can see is a map similar to the map I showed you for population gain and loss. Right? We can see young populations in the center of the state from uh, going from our northwest to our southeast. Right? So we're seeing some correlation between population change, population loss, and our aging population already just from these very initial data, right? The aging of the population is going to be very important both in terms of the vitality of a lot of the areas in our state and I believe in terms of the services that people that are offering transportation or services uh, are, are going to need to offer, right? There's going to need to be some changes perhaps in the way that those services are delivered and the types of services that are offered, okay? So I've, I've talked about population structure for you. This graphic represents the population structure in 1990 for the 10 counties on the previous map that had the oldest, the highest median age. And we can see structurally, they are very different than the state as a whole, okay? We do see um, a, a bulge um, from 25 to, to 45 in 1990 not as quite as overwhelming as it was in the rest of the state. And there, was, there is also still, <coughs> excuse me, excuse me, um, 
a significant older population in 1990 in these areas, right? I'm also going to set this graphic in motion. And what we can see are some interesting things. First of all, that um, narrow band in the center didn't really move a lot in, in the first few years. So what we were seeing there was sustained out migration of persons in basically the college year or, or early uh, career years. So we, we were seeing out migration of young persons from these areas. As we get to the, the end of this period, we can see a very lopsided structure, a structure that's very different than the state, a structure that is much, much older than the state. So the counties represented, oh, I don't have my notes here, uh, the oldest median age um, was Aiken County at 52.7, and the next county would be Cass County with a median age of 47.2, I believe. Don't quote me on either one of those statistics, but it's in the ballpark, all right? Um, consider, quite old, right, when, when we think about median age. When we think about half of the population being over 50 years of age, there is not a lot of potential for population momentum, right? There's not a lot of potential for growth through natural change. We see much more probability of decline through natural change. There's likely going to be many, many, many more deaths than there are births in an area with this type of population structure, especially as we move forward. And you know, the, note the top lines there, the uh, female 85 plus line is actually off the graph. Um, I, I would have had to change the, uh, um, the x-axis and it just wouldn't have worked for, for, for the graphic, but there are over 85 year of age women in these areas, um, well, is literally off the charts. Okay, okay so I want to bring this back down and kind of look at those structures again because I think comparing them is extremely important, right? Um, we, the blue line is uh, Aiken County, the green line is Hennepin County. Hennepin County is not our youngest county, but it is among the youngest counties. Aiken is our oldest county in terms of median age. Um, what's, you know, we have some very different structures here. We see a, a huge bulge in our older population in, in Aiken County, whereas the largest proportion of our population in Hennepin County is in these prime working age groups, right, in our, in our younger populations. So um, very different populations, very different needs in terms of transit, right? So impacts of an aging population. You know, what resources are, are going to be available um, to assist with aging in place? We are not going to have enough space for individuals in uh, elder care facilities. We are going to need to find ways to keep them in their residences or find new residences for them where they're able to maintain their own space for longer periods than perhaps we've seen in the past. I think that is going to create significant challenges for people that are going to be providing transportation services to individuals because they are going to have different needs uh, and they're going to have perhaps more time and labor intensive needs as well. We're gonna have a reduction in income from income and other specific taxes. A lot of our transportation is obviously funded through our taxes, so that's going to have local impacts as well, I believe. I already mentioned the spending shift that, that may be occurring in terms of things like elder care versus um, education, and we're going to have, force, of course, have labor force pressures. Um, I was talking to some rural transit managers last week, and one of the biggest concerns they had was finding drivers. So they're already feeling some of these labor force issues. Okay. Um, so how do we address these questions, right? This is, I'm almost done here. This is the last slide, so, uh, uh, or my contacts are mentioned there, but almost last slide. So um, changing demographics, especially in rural, how is that gonna expect, uh, affect transportation needs? Rural areas are getting much, are, are older, they're getting much older, that's going to um, significantly impact the types of services that are going to be necessary. Our rural areas are also becoming more diverse as well. That is also going to have an impact in terms of the services um, and, and um, needs that, uh, for those populations. Demographic composition, um, as we move into the future, Minnesota's gonna be a little bit older. Um, how much older is gonna be dependent upon the stock of migrants that we, that we are able to attract, but our population is going to be extremely dependent upon migration in order to continue to increase, and that is going to be played out in all area, across all areas of the state. Uh, what are a couple things that I see, um, you know, that we're, perhaps people are not paying enough attention to. Um, well, I think that I've highlighted a few of those things, right? The increased need for services for, for elder uh, individuals, 
um, the uh, increased need for different types of services as you move forward. There might be more need for uh, transportation to medical care and, those, and additional types of transportation um, needs. And I can think of a few other things, but these are really things that are off the top of my head, and I'm sure that these data have, have uh, spurred things in your mind in terms of uh, needs that you're going to be seeing moving into the future. And that's what I got. Hey. Um, <laughs> thank you very much for your attention. I really appreciate it. Uh, and if you have any questions, feel free to reach out to me at any point. Thank you. Thank you, Eric. Uh, we, do have, we have a couple minutes if anybody had any immediate questions for Eric. Yeah, Lori. You know, that's the first time I've heard that. No, it's not. Not even <laughs> close. That is a really great question. And um, to the extent to which we're able to, to um, assess the impacts of climate change are, are not really well, right? Not good at this point, right? Demographers, as I kind of alluded to, don't necessarily make predictions. We take a look at the data that we have and push that forward. We don't have a lot of data currently for you know, people moving here for, for climate-related reasons. What I can tell you is that Minnesota is situated very well in terms of being a, what I have seen referred to in the literature as a climate haven. Um, and as such, um, the more dire uh, predictions of climate change would tend to indicate to me that we're going to see stronger in migration in the future. That is really the, as far as I can go at this point without um, more data to, to interrogate the topic. Uh, with the projections that you shared today, I was wondering if you could just say what the assumptions were for the international migration. <laughs> and then, um, since that's really what we are apparently hanging our hat on in mm -hmm. terms of opportunity to grow right now, mm -hmm. what are some effective strategies you've seen to attract international migration? Um, okay, so the, some of the assumptions some of the assumptions in our projection series are, are very basic. There are some very basic assumptions in all projection series. One of them is, you know, the, this, <laughs> the top assumption is you're not going to see war, plague, and famine, right? Kind of saw a, pla a plague, right, <laughs> after, after we uh, published these projections. So there might be some issues in them. That's kind of why we're looking at producing another set um, so quickly after we're producing the, the, the previous one, because we want to see what those changes are. We use a shift share method to do um, population projections. Um, for, for better or for worse. Um, so when we think about um, the assumptions, what, one of the base assumptions is that um, the shares that we have seen in the past will be the same as, the, as the, the net shares that we see in the future. Some of those shares are based on national proportions, so there may be some, some issues with those. Um, broadly speaking, uh, the assumptions are also that the trends that we're seeing in the data are, are going to continue as we have seen them. So we are going to continue to see declining fertility rates. We have, um, you know, obviously if we stretch a line out to infinity, that's going to cross zero. We can't have negative births. So we do make some assumptions that there were um, for in terms of floors for fertility. We also um, make some assumptions about ceilings for mortality um, because we are reaching points where those are getting to the extremes because of s some of the um, um, uh, dynamics that we're seeing across the state. You know, my, um, my work in Minnesota is estimating. Um, my, my projection work is more in Michigan and South Dakota, so I, I can't speak specifically to um, Megan does the projections in our office. Uh, every assumption that are in those data, um, but we do publish a methods piece that goes through uh, exactly how we do our projections um, that also details some of our assumptions in there as well. And that is available on our website. Um, Nicole, did you have one question? Maybe our last one? Oh. You sure? Okay. All right. Well, oh, Michaela, go ahead. Maybe our last one. Uh, I see much greater diffusion across the state in terms of our Hispanic population. When I compare the, the dispersion of the populations to other communities of color, uh, other communities of color tend to, with the exception of the Native American community, tend to concentrate more heavily in our um, cities, large and small. 
um, uh, for a variety of reasons. Um, our Hispanic population doesn't necessarily tend to concentrate in those cities, and we see much more um, dispersion into our more sparsely populated areas around cities and townships. Some of this has to do with um, historical migration patterns and industries into which these individuals are, 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 are coming. So a lot of our Hispanic migrants are, are working in our agricultural industries, which is, of course, more widely spread across the state. Well, thank you again, Eric. Really appreciate it. Okay. I think especially just really great level setting for all of us as we move into our conversations with Valerie and Nicole here. Um, so as Gina said, uh, we are going to do uh, a conversation circle and fishbowl after Valerie and Nicole's presentations. And just to remind everybody, sorry, these, this one. Um, what that looks like um, after Valerie comes up and presents, myself, Valerie, and Dr. Carrie Hanning Smith are going to are going to start here in the circle, and we're going to ask uh, Carrie to sort of respond to Valerie's presentation initially with some thoughts and questions, and then we invite everyone to come join us in the circle if you have questions. So we're not going to pass the microphone around. You come and sit with us, and you can sit for as long as you have a conversation and want to talk with Valerie or with Carrie or myself. Uh, Valerie and I will stay there the whole time. Carrie, you're welcome to stay there as long as you have other comments and other things as well. Um, but as you go, you can just come and join and take a seat. And as you sit, we'll come to you in, in the course of the day. Um, and we had really great success with that last year, and we're hoping it'll be a great way to continue our conversations today. Um, so without further ado, I'm very excited to introduce Valerie Leffler as our first speaker today. She is the founder and executive director of Phoenix Mobility Rising and is an international expert in rural transportation, accessibility, and mobility as a service. And in its six years, Phoenix has launched programs in 10 states with partners that include the National Aging and Disability Transportation Center, the AARP Office of Driver Safety, Toyota North America's Social Innovation, the Ford Motor Company Fund, and the Michigan Department of Transportation. And today, Valerie Valerie's going to be speaking with us about a lot of their great work providing transportation services to rural communities. So thanks for being here. Thank you, All right. Okay. So I'm going to try. I'm, I'm not super coordinated, but we'll see how this goes here. Okay. Because I also pace a lot. Okay. Well, first of all, thank you so much for the opportunity to be here, Kyle. Uh, we do a lot of work in rural, but there are very few places where we get to talk about rural with folks who specifically want to know how do we address these issues. I myself grew up on a family dairy farm. We had about 700 acres, 300 head of Holstein cattle. And I experienced firsthand in my school that had the highest teen pregnancy as well as the community had the highest methamphetamine drug rates in the state of Nebraska. So I have a really interesting firsthand perspective of how these trends play out. You know, we talk about immigration patterns and our dairy was one of the first um, major operations within our school system to bring in and support um, employees who were not English speaking. And so what that did to our schools, the ESL, the languages, the supportive services that were needed for them as well as the healthcare system. My mom went to multiple appointments with our employee staff to advocate for them. Something is not right. Something is not right with her. She's telling me her husband is worried about her. They would go, they would get waved off, and nothing would happen. So, so I, I have a real personal connection to this challenge, and my parents are still raising uh, heifers today. All right, so today I'm going to give a little bit of background around Phoenix's work in rural transportation. We have done a lot of really exciting things, and we've kind of got a model that we are um, um, uh, scaling across the country, but I really want to focus the majority of our time in diving into the challenges, because it is super complex, multifaceted, in how these barriers present themselves in layers. Um, in addition to that, I'm going to talk about, it's not all doom and gloom, what are the opportunities we see on the horizon, and then some possible next steps for the future. All right, so, okay, so our background in rural transportation access. So we have worked in a very broad variety of states across the U.S. We've done rural and healthcare pilots in a variety of shapes and sizes funded by philanthropy, and in, with that, one of the things that's super important is you do not have the rules and regulations 
that you often have in the transit space or that you have on the healthcare space. So you can really be creative in how you break down these barriers because you do not have literally 1,100 pages of regulations that dictates getting that person from point A to point B. In addition to that, we have done work with state DOTs um, as well as insurance companies. So Centene Corporation is the parent company. Um, they insure one in 12 Americans. They are the largest Medicaid and Medicare insurance provider in the United States. And so we have some really great perspective from a variety of partners. And then here recently, we got a 10-year project with the National Institute of Health to specifically look at if we address transportation what is the change in the quality of life and the health outcomes of individuals with chronic illness or high-risk pregnancy? All right, so our vision at Phoenix, for those who aren't familiar with this, is to create mobility solutions for the health and well-being of every person in every community. And we do that by partnering with local communities and transportation partners. So Phoenix, we do not, we have transportation services in some rural communities, but we never want to start them. We are the last resort because nobody else is able to raise their hand, and we also desire to offload it to local partners once we establish the business model. Um, this transportation assistance hub, just for reference sake, based upon the pilots that we have done the past six years, really has a four-part um, structure involving humans, technology, community support, and capacity. And all of this is about creating connections and building these resources um, across the ecosystem for individuals to come to. Because in the United States, if you lack transportation, in most communities, there is nowhere to go. I don't know how to get a driver's license. Where do I go? My car broke down. I can't afford to fix it. Where do I go? But if you have food insecurity, where do you go? the food pantry. So we are looking at setting up food pantries of transportation in partnership with local communities. But that's not what we're here to talk about, but this is what we came up with after six years and all that work. Um, so these hubs basically create these multimodal connections to all social determinants of health. All right, so what are the challenges in rural healthcare access? I'm gonna get some water here, because my, I always get nervous. Awkward pause. Okay. All right. So, broken policy structure. The system is broken. This is no surprise to anybody here. The second is it's underfunded. And the third is there's limited transportation options in most rural communities. And it all is, it all is a domino effect. The fact that the policy is broken is what leads to things being underfunded. Because things are underfunded, there are limited transportation options. All three of these things work hand in hand. So how is the policy structure broken? The funding is in programmatic and contractual silos. Every single type of funding that comes out of the federal government into these different silos has different insurance requirements, has different regulatory hurdles that you have to, you have to traverse. Um, you need a legal staff to overcome some of them. Uh, Medicaid and Medicare transportation contract structure, especially for rural communities, leaves gaps for patients and transportation providers to fall through the gaps. Just so I kind of have a raise of hand, if you provide rural transportation, raise your hand. How many folks are in that space? Ish, okay, I'm seeing a couple ish. Um, if you work in a rural community or raise your hand. Okay, we got a few more, okay, okay, fantastic. All right, and the third one is that rural transportation matching funds um, creates barriers as well as regulatory challenges. It creates these disparities. And I'm gonna go into each one of these a little bit more detail because it kind of sounds like Swahili. Um, here's our silos in the United States. There's over 132 federal funding sources for transportation in the US. 132. Each of them require a different grant application, a different contract, a different vendor fill out, so on and so forth, right? And the same person, the same human, will navigate public transit, if, if, if it's available, potentially Medicaid or Medicare. If you're a veteran, the DAV, 
You could also receive funding from the Older Americans Act if you have a disability or Center for Independent Living, the justice system, so on and so forth. It is so complicated to navigate these. Many of these programs have different applications, different limitations that you run into. When we talk about what is the structure, so transportation in the grand scheme of things for Medicaid and Medicare participants, which in the state of, Mich in the state of Minnesota, there's roughly $1.1 million, roughly 20% or million dollars, million people who are on Medicaid and Medicare. That's roughly 20% of the population. In general, when Medicaid and Medicare look at their population, or look at, let me say population, is that the presentation this morning is on my mind. When they look at their budget, transportation is only 3% of that budget. So it's negligible in terms of things that they're trying to manage cost containment. I was uh, back in a former life, I did a tech startup and we were a partner with United Healthcare. And in their application to the state of Virginia to ensure their members, they only had three sentences to describe how they were gonna address transportation challenges to the state. It's just such a small part of the overall picture. Um, in addition to that, funding mechanisms and contract standards are not effective. So for rural healthcare systems, for example, um, here's, this is a hospital in um, Holmes County, Mississippi. This was one of the communities we did a pilot with Centene in. And this hospital was one of the critical access hospitals that was at risk of going out of business. Um, it was uh, several million dollars underwater, and they said if we can get more patients here, maybe, just maybe, it can break even because the community in Holmes County, Mississippi is one of the top five poorest counties in the United States. They have some of the biggest health disparities in terms of infant mortality, um, obesity, uh, heart conditions, so on and so forth. So we launched transportation. There were four public transit agencies in that community, none of which communicated with each other, but there were four that served that, that one rural county. Their public transit rates were $20 per leg in this community in high poverty. And it, I'll, I'll, we'll get to that. So nobody who needed to go could afford it. And so we said, okay, Centene said, we'll pay for all of it, free, no cost. We covered it, and who were we bringing? Minority older adults in poverty, many uninsured. Every single patient we brought them, they went further underwater. The reimbursement did not cover the cost of care. <laughs> so we solved one issue, but it did not solve the desired net cost. So this is, there's things that are broken, right? Um, and then rural transportation providers. There is a huge gap in how they are supported. Oftentimes, the insurance companies are only paying the cost of the bus fare, not the actual cost of the service. So, and then finally, this rural public transportation matching funds. So for rural public transportation, federal guidance requires that if I'm providing a bus ride in a rural community, they have to come up with 50% of the operating money and 20% of the administrative cost to show community buy-in. Well, what that does is it creates inequities in counties and cities that do not have a tourist base, that do not have a job market, and so they are asked to come up with the same amount of match as a community that has extreme resources. We work in uh, Washtenaw County, Michigan. Their average median household income is $83,000. At the same time, we are working in Holmes County, Mississippi. Their median household income, $23,000. They're expected to come up with the same amount of match. How is that fair? How can you serve older adults? How can you serve immigrants and refugees if you're asking for the same amount of money to come from those local tax bases? Um, in addition to that, matching funds, frequently provided by city and county funds, create jurisdictional limits for service. This is one of the biggest hurdles that we we rack our brains and we spend hundreds of hours every week working with individuals trying to get to healthcare. 
and employment, especially for veterans. Um, the VA and how one VA will read your chart and another VA you go to a specialist, or if you need to get to a specialist, you're generally going a longer distance away, correct? Well, when you have cities and counties that are putting up the match, they don't want you to take your money elsewhere. They want you to spend those dollars local. Well, what happens with that is then you can't leave the county. You can't leave the city. So you're landlocked. And so these population disparities that happen in, in this challenge when we talk about if you're born in this zip code, your life expectancy is 60, and if you're born in this zip code just a couple miles down the road, your life expectancy is 80. Income and transportation access are huge components of that. Harvard did a study on five million children who grew up in households in poverty, and then they followed these, these children throughout their, their young adult into careerhood. You know what the number one isolated factor was? for these children's difference between those who still lived in poverty and those who were able to get to move their families and, and leave poverty? Commute time. The ability for their parents to be a part of their lives, the ability for their caregivers to be involved and get to and from their jobs to successfully support them. All right, um, let's see here, and this last one, sorry. The FTA's equitable service requirements creates near impossible standards. So the Federal Transit Administration requires that if I have a service area, regardless of where you ask me to go, I have to be able to get there within the same amount of time. That's why most rural transportation options take at least one day, maybe three days notice, because sometimes you're going an hour and a half just to pick somebody up, right? And so if you cannot promise I can get to small town over here, at the same amount of time I can get across the street. So you, you, this, this policy barrier and the way that this is set up is really, really complicated. And where do we go to get this money that is underfunded? It's not the hospitals. <laughs> um, a lot of times that's where people say, oh, those hospitals have so much money, that's where we're gonna get this, this is where we're gonna solve it. Well, the reality is they're, they're hemorrhaging cash right now. I was just pulled this news article up last night. Minnesota released a report, or the American Hospital Association for Minnesota released a report in, um, I think, February or March that stated they lost north of, was it $400 million, the hospitals collectively in the last six months of 2023. These rural facilities and these urban facilities all together aren't, aren't able to keep their heads above water. These federal costs of cancer care, knee replacements, dialysis, uh, pregnancy reimbursement, all of that set at the federal rate in stone for generally numbers of years at a time. Medicare and Medicare, Medicare and Medicaid rates for reimbursement are less than private pay, right? So if you go to like the doctor and you have United Healthcare, Blue Cross Blue Shield or whatever, they might pay out $246 for your primary care visit to that doctor, Medicare and Medicaid might give that doctor $90 for the same visit. Some of our rural hospitals in Minnesota, 75% of the population they see is on Medicare or Medicaid, and that speaks to those older adult population trends. Those rural hospitals that were in crisis before COVID are now feeling it because cost of supplies is going up, like everything else. Go to the grocery store, you Four bags of stuff at Walmart's $200 these days. Um, and then increased cost of labor. Uh, last year before last, my husband had brain surgery. The traveling nurse in the ICU was pulling down $1,000 a day. Do you think that they uh, petitioned the Medicare, Medicaid, or whatever? We have private insurance because he's a teacher. But do you think that they get, the hospital gets a higher reimbursement rate because their costs go up? No, it stays the same. So the money's not gonna come from the hospitals. And let's talk about the transportation providers. How is, this, how is this underfunded? So reimbursement rates, so when we pay, so transportation for Medicaid and Medicare in the state of Minnesota, depending on your eligibility, can have transportation as a benefit, okay? But the transportation providers 
frequently are the lowest dog on the totem pole when it comes to how do you stay in business. And some of the challenges are for small businesses as well as transit agencies, unpaid deadhead miles to pick up the patient. You might go 36 miles to go pick somebody up. And that's on an average rural trip. Unpaid no-show. When the patient cancels, you might get to that door to pick that patient up, and they might tell you, I cannot go. I am not feeling well. I will not survive. I will make a mess on the bus. I, I will embarrass myself. I'm not going. Especially dialysis patients, because of the havoc that that wrecks on their bodies. Um, unpaid wait time. So let's say I'm going and I'm taking somebody um, to the VA hospital. I'm taking somebody at 64 miles. I, if I come back to my home base to take another trip, I'm not gonna make it back in time to get that person, or they're gonna wait three or four hours. If I do wait, it's not paid in the current state, infra in the current state rates. In addition to that, billing is lengthy and complicated. Um, public transit agencies reimbursement is often limited to the cost of the bus pass, as I mentioned earlier, versus the actual cost of providing service. So here's an example of what these costs are right now off the, in the state of Minnesota. Get $12.10 to pick up somebody, and then it's roughly $1.43 a mile. If they need a little bit more assistance, it's $14.30 uh, for pickup and $1.43 per mile. So a little bit more if you need to provide assistance. The actual cost of providing service of transportation is roughly $65 to $80 an hour. For these organizations that are able to stay in business, this is the cost. That requires that you are doing at least four trips an hour, eight hours a day. That is really hard to maintain in a rural ecosystem. So you lose money. Our, rural trans our, our organization did a rural transportation pilot with Toyota in the south of Texas. And we said, we want to launch rural, public, rural transportation Medicaid in partnership with a broker. We lost a quarter of a million dollars in four months trying to provide quality service. Because Toyota said, we, if, whether or not they say that they're ready to, whether or not they, we've confirmed we're going to make sure that we get them picked up. So by providing a higher level of service or a decent level of service, you lose money. You have to multi-load these trips that's designed for urban communities. And then when it comes to rural transportation options, each of these is super fragmented. Medicaid and Medicare requires three days notice. You're limited to transportation approved by the healthcare facilities and the trip types. In the state of Michigan, for example, if you're a foster child and you've went through a traumatic situation and you need to talk to a therapist or a psychologist, that trip type is not covered unless you have intellectual disabilities. There's so many silos of how this happens. In addition to that, you can only take two, riot, two people as a trip. So if I'm a single mom with two kids, I have to find daycare in order to go to the doctor. Um, you, and you must, this is the one that kills me every single time. You have to schedule a separate appointment to get your medication. So if you go to the doctor and they prescribe you antibiotics, you have three more days before you get to take them. Do you think that creates cascading healthcare costs, right? Public transit, one to three days notice because of all the different things you have to factor in. Limited service, limitations, you can only carry two to four bags. So if you're getting groceries as a family of four, that isn't gonna fit on your lap, right? Longer trip times, and it can be very difficult for various physical and mental health conditions. Specifically, if individuals have back issues on those rural public roads, on those washboards, right? That's not a fun trip. Or veterans who have PTSD cannot have people behind them. The sounds of the rattling of the, the ramp, et cetera, resemble that of in the Humvee. And so it can be a trigger for PTSD. Um, and then taxis, few and far between. It's not enough demand to keep them in business. And then veteran transportation, huge numbers of challenges in terms of it's limited to volunteers that um, do not wear CPAP machines and can pass a DOT physical. You cannot bring your spouse unless they've actively served in the military. I can't count on my fingers and toes a number of veterans who got cancer diagnoses and their spouse was not able to be with them for that conversation. Imagine how gut-wrenching. These men and women served our country. They can't even bring their family with them to, to hear these experiences or have these conversations. 
um, often requires you still have to get to the pickup point. Even though you're not going 60 miles, you might still have to get five, which if you're in a wheelchair or a walker, that's a long, that's a long hike, especially in the weather. And then the volunteers or drivers may not have training to secure a wheelchair, or it may not be accessible. So really quickly on the opportunities, these are super quick. Um, the Center for Medicaid is focused on changing. They're focused on patient-centered practices and value-based incentives for patient outcomes. So they're trying to say, if you can get somebody well, we will pay you more than if you just treat and release, treat and release, treat and release. So we can get, if we can get somebody healthier, we'll give you more money. So that's good. So they're looking at all these ancillary things, like paying for food, paying for gym memberships, paying for transportation. Um, enhanced coordination of funding with mobility wallet technology, and then increased participation for philanthropy and corporate sponsorships with matching funds. This goes back to that increase of equitable communities. So this is basically CMS's strategy goals on equity and engagement, outcomes and alignment, safety and resilience, and interoperability and scientific achievement. They know the system's broken, but they're trying their best to work through the behemoth of policy. Um, these funding silos gone with a mobility wallet. This is one of the programs that we've deployed now in three states where, depending on where you're going, the patient's experience is seamless. All of the billing and all of the back end happens on either the local nonprofit side that's providing the service or Phoenix's end. And so it re resembles, you remember right now, um, any, anybody remember food stamps? When you have to go to the grocery store and you got so many stamps for milk and so many stamps for cheese and, and then eventually like they added corn flakes and things like that. Well, this is the picture of a food stamp in 1997. This is where we are with a lot of rural or urban, for that matter, transportation funding, right? You have little silos of you get this much cheese and this many, you get this many rides for public transit and this many rides for Medicare, this many rides for Medicaid, yada, yada. It's super fragmented. 2024, every state in the country uses this EBT card where you have dignity, you have freedom of choice. You can slap your, slide your card and get the resources that you need. So that is the mobility wallet. And then what we're also seeing, because we're not talking about transportation as in, we need you to fund a wheel, we need you to fund gas, we need you to fund equitable communities. And what we're doing is tapping into these ESG goals of these transportation companies that are happening in the, um, in the private sector to match all the different federal funding sources that are out there. So it comes together very well. Because you cannot, nobody lives in a vacuum. Nobody lives to go to the doctor. So what are the next steps to the future? Really quickly, research determine utilization of Medicare and Medicaid service for rural zip codes and complaints filed. Why is this important? I would put money, your rural communities are not utilizing this transportation benefit because very frequently it either doesn't work or when it doesn't work, word of mouth gets out and people stop calling. We saw this in every single state we've worked in. You might have to get a FOIA request to get this data because a lot of times they don't have it. And then connect that with your demographic information. I would be thrilled to see what percentage of rural community residents who are not identifying as Caucasian, who are using Medicaid or Medicare transportation. Those families need access to the doctor, and they're not getting it. I would, at least many of which, are probably not getting it. Uh, reviewing the actual cost of service with transit and NEMIT providers, those Medicaid and Medicare providers, with a business analyst. That $14 an hour, $1.43 a mile, nobody's staying in business. They can't afford to serve it, and then what happens so those trips don't get picked up. They get left, they get abandoned because they can still meet their contracted performance requirements and not provide the rural expensive trips. We saw that happen when I worked with the Nebraska Department of Transportation. They literally were canceling expensive rides because the Medicaid and Medicare providers get paid per member per month whether or not you take a ride or not. So it's set up for them to make more money the less rides they take. And it's much easier to decline a rural ride that costs a lot than it is to decline an urban ride that's $30. And then utilize mobility wallet technology to leverage funding. So 
There we go. I went a little bit over, but thank you so much for your time. I hope this was insightful. share some initial thoughts, and then as others come up, I have some other questions too, but uh, at any point here, there are a number of here, so if you want to add any other comments, please join us here. Okay. Thanks, Kyle. Um, I'll start just by introducing myself so that you know why I'm here in this circle, and I want to thank you, Valerie, for an excellent presentation that was really exciting. Um, I am an associate professor in the School of Public Health, and I help to co-direct the University of Minnesota Rural Health Research Center and our rural health program here at the University of Minnesota. So I'm squarely in public health, and I think about health outcomes and healthcare access a lot in what I do, but I can't do that without thinking about transportation. It's such a critical social driver of health, and it's such an important piece of the conversation. So I think that's why you invited me, Kyle, and I'm excited to be here. I just wanted to add a few more thoughts to emphasize the importance of what we're talking about, and then I have lots and lots of questions for you, but I'll limit myself to just one or two to start, and I hope others will join us. Um, I just really want to emphasize the importance of thinking about transportation as a critical foundational determinant of rural health outcomes. And this is important because it's layered on to decades of rural health inequities. The mortality gap that we have between rural and urban populations didn't really start until the early 1980s, but it's only widened ever since then. COVID made it even wider and just Two weeks ago, a week and a half ago, the CDC released their newest report of rural mortality compared with urban mortality, and we see that those gaps continue to get even wider, even as the demographics of rural places are changing, even as the healthcare landscape is changing, those uh, differences in health outcomes persist and get worse. Um, and layered on top of that, I just want to add a little more texture to emphasize the importance of healthcare access that you talked about. Uh, so probably everyone in this room has heard about the issue of rural hospital closures. Valerie got at the issue of rural hospital finances, which are not great in a lot of places. Since 2005, we've had 105 rural hospitals close completely across the country, and close to another 100 have converted to other types of care settings. We've also seen declines in just about every other service line that anyone might need. Nursing homes, obstetric units, pharmacies, I could go on and on and on, but accessing care, especially in a brick and mortar setting in rural areas has gotten harder as the decades have gone on and that doesn't show any signs of getting better anytime soon, partly for all of the reasons that you outlined. But on top of that, we heard a really nice conversation before yours about changing demographics in rural areas. That actually brings me a lot of hope. I think when we talk about rural, it comes with some doom and gloom. I wouldn't be doing the work that I do if I felt like it was all doom and gloom. I have a lot of hope and a lot of excitement about the people who live in rural areas and some of the innovation and some of the thriving communities that we have. So I just want to put that out there too. There's a lot that's going well and there's a lot that brings me hope. Um, but I think that that's part of the conversation. Who lives there? Who needs transit from one place to the other? Uh, there's a lot more that I could say there, but I want to start the conversation. I want to invite you back into the conversation by asking you a question. And this is a question that I get a lot. So this is sort of a, a selfish question. I want to hear your thoughts so that I can answer this more intelligently. But the landscape of healthcare is changing really quickly, and it's changing in some ways more profoundly in rural areas because of technology and telehealth and the places that have lost services. We know not all of those services are going to come back. And there are obviously some services for which people will always need to be seen in person. But I'm curious, as you approach this work in Phoenix, how much your thinking about 
telehealth or new models of care delivery as part of what you're doing and how, how do we decide when are those times when someone critically needs that transportation from point A to point B and when are there times when we could do things differently to better meet people's needs because of all of the challenges that you outlined? Yeah, that's a great question. So that was during the pandemic, um, we did a variety of telehealth amalgamations, you might say, uh, is partnership with Toyota. And then we also were working with um, the Transportation Research Board and the National Academies of Sciences, trying to break down and provide some kind of service in South Texas for families who um, did not have internet at home, and particularly children. We're working with a mental health, um, a rural mental health facility, and one of the things that they were, because of COVID, right, they, you could not bring individuals into the office. And so the doctors were tr calling. Well, if you're, t anybody have teenagers? Have teenagers <laughs> like to talk on the phone? Like, it's, 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 it's brutal, right? And so these children with post-traumatic stress syndrome from hurricanes or who had witnessed horrible things through abuse and family or just ha had genetic challenges, a variety of things, the doctor was trying to, you know, decide how do we prescribe medication for this child based upon a phone call. And so what we did is we took Wi-Fi enabled tablets to the home. And so what that did is that enabled the doctor to go from a, a, a singular way to understand the patient to see the patient. They could see the child's face. They could see their, their facial reactions to certain questions versus over the phone. You don't get that, right? They also could see body movements. Were they twitching? Were they um, snapping their fingers? Were they looking up and down? You know, just different things. It, in, it changed the quality of care they were able to have. But a lot of the families did not have um, Wi-Fi in the home, or they did not have, um, if they did, like there was one mother who had um, three children in school, but the Chromebooks would not load the EHR software for the hospital because it was locked down. So even though they had lab laptops and they had a, a Wi-Fi device for the, um, for, that the state provided as part of the Medicare, Medica part of the Medicaid uh, program at that time, the, the mother still could not get the children to access the doctor's care on the, the school provided laptops. Um, so we saw that. And then what we also saw from that is, is partnerships that began to emerge. Um, there's a transportation uh, program, Comfort Care, that works with the foundation in South San Antonio. And they have a program called GrandPad, where the Medicaid provider, uh, transportation provider, basically takes this, I, um, what is it, uh, tablet that's iPhone, not an iPhone iPad, there you go, sorry, I'm an Android person, <laughs> that takes an iPad into the home and it's got two buttons on it. So if I'm 85 and I'm not gonna, all this rigmarole, I don't have to mess with it. I press the button and it will connect me to my appointment. And so what they're doing is taking the grand pad to somebody's house so they can have that appointment with their care provider. The barriers or the challenges when it comes to, why, to telehealth when we had these conversations, we're delivering it, sometimes um, the living conditions prevent the individual from having privacy. So for example, if I'm living with a partner that may be domestically abusive, I may not feel comfortable saying what happened that night. Or in particular, where there was one family where she was trying to you know, have a, her doctor appointment, she's got kids running around and she's trying to talk about these major health things that she's struggling with. And so there was an, an environment to have that privacy. So in some cases, what would happen is our driver would actually go in the house and watch the kids. And the moms either sat on the porch or the dads would sit on the porch or go to the car. Mm -hmm. So they had a private space to have that conversation with their doctor. Um, in one case, we actually had like the, the roommate of the person there um, was like screaming at the individual while they were on their doctor's appointment. And so, you know, there, there's all these dimensions to multi-generational households or families who are unhoused and how they access that, that the privacy and the, the technology access is, is a challenge. So we've seen a lot of dimensions of challenge and complexity to that, but we've seen hope in some, in some venues where that can be, um, the challenges can be reduced. Thank you. I, that resonates so deeply with me, and sometimes I worry that we're putting 
too many eggs in the telehealth basket without thinking about all of the complexity that you're bringing up here and the ways that transportation is still a part of the puzzle even if people are getting care in their home. How are they getting access to those devices? I'm also thinking of so many stories I heard from rural places during COVID when kids were trying to do online schooling and they would need to drive to the parking lot of the local McDonald's or public library and sit there even if it was after hours just to try and tap into Wi-Fi because that wasn't available at home and I think that that's clearly happening for healthcare too and transportation needs to be a part of those conversations about telehealth too. I know I'm preaching to the choir but. Well and I think one other piece of that that we hear is that the it's not so much even just about the appointment, but it's the isolation. Mm -hmm. Sometimes that bus driver or that transportation driver is the closest confidant that that person may have. Mm -hmm. And it may be the, like when we look at some of the data in terms of how, how often I've left my house for non-medical reasons, for in rural communities especially, you'll see I haven't left my house more than three times in the past month for rural health care than other than go to the doctor. So that person is literally one of the only people I've talked to outside of my home, many of which who live alone. So that, that ability to be like, how was your day? What's going on? How's your cat? What's new with your mother-in-law? You know, all those things are such an important part of that mental health journey as well. Yeah, they really are. And it, social well-being in rural communities is a real passion area of mine and a focus of a lot of my research. And sometimes I think healthcare and transportation for healthcare is the entry point, mm -hmm. the place where we have the most funding available or we've invested the most resources, but it can't be the end point because we need just a lot more investment to address social well-being, connectedness. Oh, we have a friend in the circle. Hi. Hi everyone, good morning. My name is Mai Zhang. I work for MnDOT um, and uh, in a, currently in a work out of class as a transportation equity planner. Um, really great presentation. Thank you so much uh, for sharing all the work that you're doing. Um, there was something that you brought up at the end of the presentation about how you know uh, some of the communities of color, parents, um, you know, immigrant parents uh, may not be accessing the transportation resources, like the wallet, transportation mm -hmm. wallet that you had developed. And um, I was just curious about, you know, what are the current um, organizations or resources in the community that could be, um, that could possibly close that gap? Or if there's something missing, what, what would that look like? What would that resource look like um, in order to connect people who have a language or technology barrier to this resource? Yeah, um, so what we have done is work with local community organizations that specifically are focused on supporting, um, and it depends on the um, nationality, but, but specifically supports that group. So for example, in Winnebago County, Wisconsin, there is a um, nonprofit that specifically focuses on providing ESL classes in the community, they work in partnership with Tyson, they work in partnership with the Foundry, and they're working not only with their employees, but also the school system. And so what we did is we went to them and we said, hey, we have this transportation option. What we also did to take it the next step further is we made sure our app, when it pulled up in native Spanish on the phone, the app also translated things accurately. We also made sure that our materials were translated um, into not Spanish, not, not Spain Spanish, but in particular Mexico Spanish. And, and how does that language resonate? Because there definitely were variances in how you said eligibility criteria for this trip is, right? Um, and so it was about being very thoughtful and intentional about we're not the experts, that local community partner are the experts, and then getting feedback from local residents on you know, for example, in our user group, we have somebody who only who speaks Spanish as a first language, and him and a translator come to the, the our user advisory group, and he was showing us in our very first one. He's like, "Hey, I pulled this up, but I don't think you mean this means this in the app. We need to correct the the language there." So it's getting that first person feedback and just being open and receptive to that information. But um, I think that's one part of it. The other is. Um, making sure that those local resources um, have the information on how to report if something isn't going wrong. So for example, if your Medicaid or Medicare transportation provider does not pick you up 
or you have a grievance. Maybe you were sexually assaulted. We had, um, when we were working with that mental rural health facility, they had a driver who exposed himself to the, to the woman in the van. And the, the public transit's response to that, not to say that would ever happen in Minnesota, but the, the public transit's response to that is you can only now ride with female drivers. And so she had two drivers out of 40 that she could ride with. So her ability to access care as a pregnant woman was significantly declined as she was struggling with postpartum. Mm. And, and so, or as a recently pregnant woman. And so anyway, all that to be said, she didn't know who to go to to report that. And so when you are in, in, in those communities, those individuals who are the advocates need to know to report that to the State Department of Health and Human Services. They need to know that to report that to the state DOT. Because what happened is it just gets squished under the rug. And when you're talking about complaints and compliance in those contracts, it happens at the state level. So if I call the transit agency or I call the um, Medicare, mode of care, MTM is the provider that you have here, and I report, hey, my ride didn't show up, they don't have to share that information with the state. That's considered member abrasion and stays under the rug. But if I call my senator or if I call Health and Human Services and I report it, then it gets filed. Then that's documented. And people who are in the community or maybe have family members who are in the community without all of the documentation or in just general, you don't want to bring them in the community even if you're there, you don't want them to be a part of what may be a challenge uh, for a neighbor or a family member. Um, you know, so having that advocate to make that report is huge. Bill, do you want to add in? We're going to, unfortunately, your, your comment and question will be our last one for this conversation, and then we'll take a quick break and transition to the I hate day. to be between a break no, and... <laughs> so we'll keep it real short. But Bill Goins, uh, I'm involved with Commerce Mobility, which is freight, but also uh, tied to a veterans organization called Saluting American Veterans Enterprise. And I wanted to come back to your comment, uh, or certainly what you showed in your presentation about veterans. Our veteran community today is, is in a challenging spot. The suicide rate is off the charts. We have lost over 70,000 veterans <clears throat> just since 2010, which is more personnel than we lost in Vietnam, Afghanistan, and Iraq combined. And a lot of it, you know, you can ask what the root cause is. And here's the other statistic about that is the rate of suicide today among women is higher than the rate of suicide among men. So it is an area that we're really concerned about, and our rural areas are really taking the hit for some of the reasons that you touched on. So can you talk a little bit more? I mean, there's a, just a plethora of programs, organizations out there, but it's the rural community that is isolated, turn to alcohol, veterans turning to alcohol, drugs, and then if they don't get any way out to get the help that, and get to the services they need, suicide becomes the, the resort. Mm -hmm. So can you touch on some of the things that maybe are being done either on a federal or levels that you've been engaged with, please? Yeah, absolutely. So one of the reasons, so we, we have a rural transportation uh, pilot in Michigan in an area where the VA hospital specifically said, we have the highest veteran suicide rate per capita in these counties. Will you go there and help? Because they could not get, there were no VA hospitals in the county, and the, the, none of the transportation providers could cross county, or if they did, the cost of the ride was roughly $180. That's a lot of money to come up with to get to an appointment. And so um, we worked with the state and we deployed a mobility wallet and we get referrals from veteran service organizations, from school systems, from um, churches that come into the program with the Transportation Assistance Hub. And then we do what we call an intake assessment where we determine, is this individual living alone? Do they have a caregiver? Are they, do they have a veteran service disability? Um, have, they, have they applied? Um, there's a lot of different resources the VA has available. I was in DC when they were doing one of the final hearings in the House and the $365 billion the VA allocates each year. Um, and one of the things that they talked about specifically was this rural challenge. Um, the VA had a study commissioned in 2018 and they looked at 2.4 million encounters for, veteran trans for veterans in healthcare. 
to the VA, and they found that veterans without transportation access were 3.75 times more likely to attempt suicide if they did not have transportation identified. Because the isolation, you cannot get help. And a lot of folks who are older are, are living alone, that, and so they do not have somebody saying, hey, I think I, think I, can, I can help you get through this. I wanna, I wanna connect you. Well, let's go to the game on Friday, right? And so it's investing more money in transportation to help individuals not only get to that VA appointment, but to also get to the local peer support group, to also get to local SUD treatment in privacy. Because you don't want the world many times knowing I'm going to my AA meeting, right? Especially if they're in a, in a you know, environment where they, you know, long story, but yeah. Um, so, so that is one of the areas that we're actually looking for is to pilot and grow that with the VA, is work with a state VA department and fund a wallet. So right now it's funded by the state DOT. And if we funded it through the VA, there'd be a federal funding stream. Because what they're talking about doing in DC is building more rural community hospitals, which <laughs> critical access hospitals can tell you, uh, that's not gonna be your answer. Um, and so, you can buy a real nice bus with a real well-trained driver for the cost of putting a hospital in a community. And so I think that's some of the things that we need to look about in policy change and also support of local fundraising. Like a lot of times we raise money for healthcare, we raise money for education, but we don't have fundraisers for transportation. Mm -hmm. And so that's something that, you know, a couple classic car shows and you can get folks to where they need to go. Thank you. Thanks, Bill. And thanks, everybody, for those questions and Carrie for your comments. And Valerie, again, for your talk. It is my pleasure to introduce Dr. Nicole Morris, who's the director of the Human Factor Safety Lab. New name. Great. Sounds great. Um, many of you have probably heard from Nicole and heard about her great research, uh, but her main research interests are in human factors around transportation safety, especially as it relates to in-vehicle technologies, pedestrians, and non-motor safety data collection and gender biases in trauma care, as well as workforce safety. Um, and her most recent research has examined interactions between drivers and automated vehicles, pedestrian safety programs, and work zone intrusion mitigation, as well as rural intersections, which is some of what we're going to hear about today. So with no further ado, Dr. Thank Nicole Morris. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, I don't have a compatible thing, so I'm not going to wander, um, which is Fine, I'm just gonna pretend I'm in uh, cement here. Um, well, I'm Nicole Morris. Some of you may have heard my uh, lab before was the Human First Lab, and I recently rebranded the lab last week uh, to the Human Factor Safety Lab, and hopefully that conveys what we do, which is human factor safety work. Um, and I'm really excited to talk with you about this topic today. Um, you know, similar to um, uh, other folks in the room, I'm sure, I, I have a, a really, personal connection to rural traffic safety. I also grew up in, in a rural community. I grew up in rural Kansas. Um, and you know the, the list goes on of the people that I know quite personally who have died in, in traffic crashes, um, almost all of them under age 25. And as we heard today, we can't afford to lose those folks in our rural communities. Um, so this is, this is really near and dear to me. Um, and my experiences are not unique. Um, you know, what, what we experience in rural Kansas of, of having just a tremendous amount of, of deaths and traffic crashes is really what we see nationwide. And so when we look at U.S. Uh, crash fatality rates um, from 2010 to 2019, it was threefold higher in rural communities than in our metropolitan urban communities. Um, when we look at kind of our crash rate per 100 million miles traveled, um, we also see a huge disparity in, in the amount of driving that we're doing. How frequently are you going to experience a fatal crash in a rural area compared to an urban area? And Minnesota shares the same trend that we see nationwide. Um, despite having the bulk of our communities and our population in the, in the urban parts of our state, we have this hugely disproportionate amount of our fatal crashes happening in rural areas. Um, many of those are happening on our, on our trunk highway system. Um, and so really when we're looking to reach that, that very important zero deaths, we must be looking at our rural communities to find out um, how do we stop these deaths from happening. And of course, the reason for 
um, this disproportionate rate of, of fatal crashes in rural areas compared to urban is very complex. There's no one single silver bullet um, for this. So we see um, many, many things, and, and so I'm just going to give kind of a list of some of the key ones. Um, behavioral differences um, are, are prominent in some of these main areas. So lower seatbelt use and proper child restraint. We see lower use of those in our urban or in our rural areas compared to urban. We see slightly higher rates of drunk driving, um, and we also see greater incidence of driver fatigue. Um, you can imagine sort of these long stretches of a very boring road, and, and people are driving uh, late or very fatigued. Um, we also see big differences um, in emergency services. So um, this isn't necessarily about the incidence of being in a crash, but whether or not you're going to survive one of those crashes. So if you're in a very serious crash, uh, right here in the, in the metro area, you're minutes from a level one trauma center. Um, somebody's gonna know that you crash probably through our camera system in the metro. Um, and those emergency services are going to be deployed immediately. Um, in, in rural parts of the country, that is not the case. Um, you may personally know someone who wasn't found for days or months um, and, and because they go off the road and are in some ravine or a lake or, or some brush, right? So we have slower time for police to reach them slower time for emergency services reach them. Then it's longer to get to the right services. Um, there may be some under triaging. So I'll let Mike maybe talk about this later of some of these decisions that get made very early on at the crash scene about where should this person go? How do we get them there? Um, can sometimes mean life or death for that individual. Um, for pediatric trauma, this can be very detrimental because there may not be a pediatric trauma center anywhere that is within reach. Um, and then we have some big disparities of the skill and availability of the EMS providers. Some of those EMS providers in the metro are very highly skilled. Some of them in rural areas are not skilled at all, maybe have very, very limited training um, and are not going to be providing really quality care in that golden hour that we're often referring to in emergency services. And of course, this list goes on and on you know, of these other things of, you know, fragility of older populations, which are more pronounced in, in our rural uh, populations. Uh, women are less likely to be involved in crashes, but more likely to die from crashes when they're involved in, in crashes. And so, um, you know, this, this really goes on and on. You also have some things that are getting in there that are very hard to track, like suicide by, by motor vehicle, which we were m mentioning suicide uh, a little bit ago. Um, those are very, very hard to track and know when they're happening. Um, so, so lots of complexity there. And then, of course, finally, some major infrastructure differences. Um, so one of the big things is horizontal curves. Um, and these are just, quite frankly, very deadly. Um, when we look at some of our crash data, um, if you put Minnesota roadways end on end, I heard this uh, from Katie Fleming a long time ago at MnDOT, but she said if you put all the roadways end on end, it's only about 3% of that roadway in, in Minnesota is, is a curve. But yet we have almost half of our fatal crashes for like motorcycles happening on those curves. It just shows you how dangerous uh, horizontal curves can be. Um, additionally, roadside obstructions, so fixed objects, trees or culverts, things that if you run off the road, you're gonna ram into. Um, and then finally, uh, a, a big trend um, of, of deaths that you may see and, and a big topic of my conversation today is about through stop intersections. So if you're not familiar with a through stop intersection, you have a major roadway where the traffic flows through, there isn't a stop, and then you have a crossing roadway. This may be a county road that is crossing and they are going to have a stop. So that person um, that's at the stop sign, they, they need to stop first and foremost, and that doesn't always happen. And then they need to make a good and safe judgment about when to cross, which also sometimes does not happen. Um, and these get very complicated when we're at divided highways. So um, think about you know, traveling down to Rochester on, on 62. So people are going far above the speed limit very, very far above the speed limit. And then you have lots of county roads that are crossing those roadways. People need to travel across four lanes of traffic um, to get across those intersections. And often if they're making a, a bad decision, it's in the far two lanes. Um, so they make a decision to cross at the stop sign um, and underestimate how quickly uh, cars are coming or maybe they don't see cars coming at all. 
So it's really important because of all those factors that I mentioned about the survivability of crashes, we have to prevent these crashes from happening um, in our rural areas. And you know, we've tried lots of things over the years for you know, intelligent signage and, and lots of things that we've tried to do to help assist people at making better decisions at these through stop intersections. Um, and ultimately we have to go to one of the more kind of extreme engineering solutions, which is just to restrict the behavior. Um, and so when you restrict that that movement, you can reduce the points of conflict that drivers are going to interact with as they're crossing these lanes of traffic. Um, so the solution to this is called the J-turn intersection um, uh, for the moment. <laughs> uh, this has been called the R-cut, the RCI, back to the J-turn, back to the R-cut. Now we're back to the uh, J-turn again. Um, the number of times I've had to do find and replace in my documents <laughs> goes on and on. So let's stick with J-turn, MnDOT, please. Um, so the, the J-turn intersection, um, it does, it just simply reduces those points of conflict. So you, you simply can't cross the intersection anymore. If you're trying to cross those four lanes, you can't do that anymore. If you're trying to turn left um, at that intersection, you can't do that anymore. It, it simply restricts those points of, of movement. Um, and so you have to do it through a series of kind of counterintuitive movements. So unfortunately, um, the, despite the fact that this is a very life-saving um, intersection design, communities can be very resistant to it because it's counterintuitive. They, you know, it's like all oh, these engineers are coming up with these newfangled things, and you know, but but ultimately that restriction is very important. Um, and so, if you want to um, to cross this intersection, um, you're going to have to make a right turn, then change lanes, get into the turn lane, make a U-turn. Um, and then make another right turn. So to go straight, now you have to do multiple things. If you want to go left, you're going to make a right turn, make a U-turn, and then pr proceed on straight. Um, so certainly people get a little frustrated with this. Um, it may increase your travel time slightly. It may not. Um, sometimes if you have really high ADT, it actually speeds things up because you only have to get through the two flows of traffic um, at a time rather than waiting for all four to clear. Um, there are also concerns about accessibility if you have businesses nearby, um, and then a lot of worry about large commercial trucks. If these are in rural areas, can big farm vehicles and commercial vehicles get through them? Uh, they can, uh, but there's always nervousness about that. Um, in my research through a series of simulation studies, um, we have found that first time users of this roadway can be sometimes very confused and make some, some errors ranging from kind of small minor things to more critical things. Um, so. You know, if we, we ask people to, to go left at this intersection, um, we don't give them a lot of instruction. We kind of just treat them like they would have just come upon this intersection in the real world. Um, we see sometimes that they um, will make a late lane change, so they might make the right turn, um, but then they don't realize they need to get over into that, that deceleration lane to make the U-turn. You could imagine that could put you at risk of a sideswipe crash or potentially a rear end crash if you change lanes really dramatically that, in a way that traffic is not expecting. Um, sometimes they then just miss the U-turn, and so you can imagine that really f increased frustration for drivers, and they're going to have to maybe go a mile down until the next cutover. Um, uh, sometimes they get very disoriented. Um, so uh, you can see that bottom. Uh, we saw this with three, uh, three of our participants who were all over the age of 65, and, and they got a little bit disoriented once they got into it. So they made a U-turn, and then they would make another U-turn. One sort of made a first U-turn, and then turned left again and, and went back the way that they had been coming. You know, so it's just very disorienting, potentially, for older people. Um, the most dangerous uh, um, behavior that you would see is that top one, cutting through the turn lane. Um, and so uh, I see that a lot when I do demos, um, having you know, young students come through the lab, and I don't give them any instructions, and inevitably they will go through the middle, sometimes because they just don't know how else to do it. Um, sometimes in the real world, this is quite intentional. People just don't want to make the U-turn, and so they go through the middle, of potentially going head-on into traffic. So what happens when you're proposing one of these life-changing intersections uh, in a community where they're really resistant? Well, you can have a lot of very, very noisy folks in those communities that create a lot of pushback for the, the engineers in the area. Um, and so, uh, you know, very contentious community meetings, 
uh, people that are, are reaching out, screaming at the, the engineers, reaching out to their, their council members to say, you know, we, we can't be letting MnDOT do this. Um, and it really slows things down um, and then potentially raises the cost inevitably of that construction because of the delays. Um, the other thing is they could just be telling their friends, right, telling other people in parts of Minnesota about how bad these things are, and then when they get proposed in that person's community, then the, the pattern just repeats. So it's really important um, because these do really save lives so dramatically. We need to get them deployed, but, but we can't just be ramming these down community members' throats and hoping that they will accept them, that the pushback will continue. So... Um, so we know that, that we, we really want to make sure that not only they have this acceptance, um, but it is really important to be sort of educating people because like we saw in my research, people can be making some pretty remarkable errors if they don't really know that these things are coming. They don't know how it works. They haven't had some opportunity to understand how to navigate them um, in advance. So one of the things that we did in our research was look at some, some different methods of persuasion. And one really good effective way um, to persuade people is through the use of testimonials. We're very, we're very social creatures and we want to hear from other people. We want to connect with other people who have shared in an experience, kind of give us insight into what it's going to be like. This works in, in healthcare um, and it can also work in transportation of hearing from real people who they can say, you know, we had this thing go in our community and it was great and this is how. Right? But you have to be able to make that connection. So it needs to have something that we call transportation, which is a funny thing because I don't mean that kind of transportation, but it, it trans transportates you into the story. You get very immersed and, and you get lost in the story. So finding people that are very good storytellers is very important. Um, you need them to be able to think. It needs to evoke not only an emotional response, but a cognitive response. How will this thing affect my life? How might my life change? And get them to be thinking in that way. Um, certainly the person needs to be credible. Um, and they need to have a strong message. It needs to be someone that they can identify with. Um, so I have a three, I don't have time for all of them, so I cut uh, uh, Trooper Delwu. I will say he's a fantastic speaker, um, and, and he has come to these community meetings and gives really powerful in-person testimony where people are very noisy at the start of it, and after Trooper Delwu speaks, you could hear a pin drop. Everybody is really connected to his message, um, but I'm, I'm unfortunately not going to have time for both of those. Um, this first one is James Irwin, and he um, uh, tested very well um, in, our, in our research. People really connected with his credibility, as you will see. Um, we lovingly call him Boat Guy in our lab. James Irwin with the Lumacraft Boat Company. I'm the president and general manager here. Uh, I've been here since 1995, and uh, Lumacraft's been in St. Oh, the first concerns we had was our semi-trucks that deliver our product from here. Um, so our misperception was, is that U-turn gonna be difficult to navigate? Is that U-turn gonna be hard for the truck drivers to, to work with? Uh, and the biggest answer is when we talked to some of our truck drivers that have experienced them already, they all were in favor of them. Um, they see the benefit of, of how it reduces the conflict. They think it's actually easier to navigate in the end. And so I think, you know, trust the people that drive daily. You know, trust the truck drivers. They're the ones that have been through this, you know, thousands of times. They know what they're doing. We did do kind of an educational piece um, to hand to some of our vendors that deliver here just so their drivers would know that this was coming and what to deal with so they knew how to still get here, especially during the road construction, but even afterwards. Uh, and for the most part, you know, we got good feedback on that, that they appreciated it. Um, but again, most of them, most of the truck drivers had experience with it and their U-turns aren't that bad. Um, that was probably our biggest misperception is just thinking the U-turn would be difficult. I like them. Um, I've actually got experience with both the one here in St. Peter uh, for work, and then actually there's one just south of my house, the one on Highway 14, and I think it's with 27 there, just outside of Eagle Lake. Um, once you get the hang of them, they're easy, and you can see how they reduce you know, the, the, the potential for accidents, or if you're gonna have one, it's gonna be a lot less. So uh, the next one that I have is uh, Art Benson, and, and I'm um, gonna start playing this. I'm gonna talk over it just a little bit. But, but Art um, tells that more personal uh, connection about Benson. being involved in a crash. Uh, I moved here uh, to Wilmer in 1981. I'm married. I have uh, three children. Uh, work at a store in town here, uh, Sound Image. Been here for 35 years. Um, 
the day of my accident that I had, um, I got to experience uh, the intersection. Um, I was taking my son to weightlifting in the morning, and we were driving a uh, Mitsubishi Eclipse, small little car. And as I came across, it was early in the morning, and uh, as I came across the uh, median between the two north and south lanes, um, I was just driving, and all of a sudden my son yells my name out, and uh, I look over again, because I look first, and there was a truck. And so I ended up uh, uh, hitting the side of this uh, tandem truck and spinning around and ending up in the ditch. And uh, of course, uh, uh, we were okay, but it was uh, very scary at that point. But the, the J-turn definitely worked because now you faced the oncoming traffic. So when you, uh, in our particular situation, if you're coming, um, uh, you're gonna head south on the 71 is what it's called. Um, then you have to make a left-hand turn and it brings around and it's like a U-turn. Uh, a legal U-turn, of course, uh, but uh, you face the traffic coming up, so the chance of, of accidents is almost nil right now. Well, my per perspective always would be uh, to go through an R-cut or a J-turn, would be if you take a little bit more time, that's okay. You know, I think sometimes we're all in such a hurry that we don't think about what's the safety, what's the next thing we should do, and, and to me that would be, as a, as a parent, you know, of, of, of children, older children or grandparent would be what's the safety side of, of the intersection at that point. So this last piece here, um, and this is going to be a, a little tricky for me to navigate, um, but you know, I, I have a number of driving simulators in my lab, and, and, but that's not very scalable. How can I have you know, thousands of Minnesotans experience an, an, a J-turn in my simulator here on, ca on campus, and even taking our affordable simulator out to rural areas. And so uh, this is a real intersection um, in Minnesota near Mankato, and it's a 360 camera that is mounted to Peter Easterlin's um, I'm going to drag it. So they can't drive it themselves, but they can look around as a driver would to see what, what it really feels like to be immersed at a, J, a real J-turn intersection. So, and, and what's really cool about these 360 videos is um, if you watch it on your YouTube app on your phone, you can hold it in front of your face and pan around like, uh, like VR glasses, VR goggles. So it's very, very immersive. You can see, I mean, this goes to show you whoa, <laughs> the 360 nature of it. So when we tested these, um, you know, we found that there are some differences um, in what communities are looking for, what they respond to. Um, and so we found um, that the, just the informational video, so just that polished thing that you would expect a DOT to put out, the urban audiences liked that pretty well. Um, but when we looked at our suburban audiences, they really responded a little bit better to those testimonials. They really liked that storytelling. Um, and this, the, the simulation that I just showed you, that had some of the best buy-in in our rural communities. Um, and so it just goes to show that um, you, you do have subtle differences um, in, in how accepting they are. Now the good news is um, we found kind of acceptance increase kind of regardless of the method. Of course, you got a better lift in some communities using different strategies, uh, but for the most part, you know, people came in a little bit skeptical. We asked them sort of, are these things a good idea? Would you be willing to drive on one? And would you be supportive of one being in your community, right? So those are very different things. This is, gets a little bit into that NIMBY mindset. Yeah, they're fine. For, for rural areas or for somewhere else, but do I want do I want it in my backyard? I um, mean, you can see we have a little bit lower um, of that on whether or not I'd be willing to drive or whether or not it, when I want it in my community. But again, for the most part, people were um, were receptive to the R cuts after they experienced some level of community engagement. So. Um, the, the good news is it doesn't seem like you're doing a lot of harm by doing this outreach. It needs to be done, and it is effective. Um, but it is important to be really looking at 
What is the community's acceptance of, of this? What kind of community? Are there other surrogate measures that I can predict whether or not I'm going to get a lot of pushback? Um, one thing I can tell you is if you have recently put a roundabout in that community and it wasn't well received, you're not going to get good reception of the J-turn. These are highly correlated with one another. If they're pretty positive about um, a roundabout, then they're probably gonna be pretty positive about a J-turn. It's really kind of a fat, <laughs> fat roundabout in a lot of ways. Um, so, uh, but there are some good tips. So again, you know, I really suggest when we're doing this type of engagement, and I think this is scalable beyond J-turns to other types of non-traditional intersection treatments or things that we wanna do in our communities, that really using a mixed method communication strategy is important. Because even though I know that in the, in the rural areas they might respond best, to that, um, that 360 video. There's still gonna be plenty of people in the audience that aren't gonna connect to that, um, but they are gonna connect to the storytelling. Um, and we do find that, um, you know, that there is a lot of variability and, and some, some communities are gonna respond differently to different speakers. Um, we had a great testimonial from the city manager in Mankato. Not a lot of uh, support for him in rural areas. Um, and, and so sort of that like authority figure um, from government agencies may not be well received in some areas. Um, in rural areas, the Trooper Delwu was fairly well received. I think culturally there's still more sort of respect for state patrol um, than you would have for somebody that you sort of perceive to be a suit uh, working for a DOT or a city government. Um, so the other thing is getting people really involved. Um, we did find that people who uh, reported having a close call or a crash um, or having a loved one uh, involved in a close call or a crash at an intersection were more connected and more likely to be persuaded by our, our engagement. So having people sort of reflect on that, so starting your meetings and having a moment for us to all think about a time when we were affected by something, then that's gonna kind of open people up in a way that they're gonna be more receptive to that information that you're about ready to provide them. Um, so, you know, but it is important to kind of keep it short and sweet if they're less invested. Um, leading with the benefits is really important because, you know, they're, they're going to be sort of um, trying to pick apart some of the other messaging in the back of their mind while you're, while you're talking about these testimonials. So lead with the, you know, you can treat 10 intersections with the J-turn for the price of one overpass. That's very powerful, right? And, and so that's gonna really be like, oh man. And now, now they're gonna be more receptive to that educational messaging um, that's sort of, of you know, aimed at their emotions where you've already got that like cognitive um, uh, sort of um, how, pe how people want to pick apart your messaging. Um, it is again important. It, they need to be they need to be credible, um, and and you do need to be thinking about how to connect with audiences. Um, we only had one female uh, testimonial uh, speaker uh, that came through, and, and we didn't create these. We kind of worked in partnership with MinDOT, and they found folks, um, and and she was a little bit nervous and, and did a lot of sort of like shifting and, and it wasn't a great testimonial, but I can't sort of um, let go of the fact that she did so poorly in, in the testing of how much people sort of resonated with her. And so I think there could be some gender bias there about you know how much authority and credibility she had versus some of the men. Um, but also thinking about, you know, it was a largely white population. So it's, we're really reaching out to other communities, making sure that you have some good variety in your testimonials so people can really connect with, with the people that they are wanting to connect with. Um, very, very important. Um, and finally, you know, we're, we're always very tight in, in meetings, <laughs> right? Um, so how do you cut out, right? I had to, I had to cut out uh, poor Trooper Del Wu um, for this talk today. But, um, you know, so, so as our, our community uh, engagement people or our engineers and you're like, oh, I only have five minutes or I only have whatever, don't cut the testimonials. Like, they're very, very powerful. Um, cut the other stuff for all I care um, and just tell them about the testimonials. But they really just cannot be cut. Um, very, very powerful to, to use whatever precious time you have to help people make connections with other people. It's very, very powerful. Um, so I'm, I'm going to end there. Um, I have lots of like references, so if you want, if you want to reach out to me, I'm happy to share all of those. 
Um, but you know, I, I do want to kind of circle back to this idea um, about fragility um, and survivability of crashes. Um, because it is just so important that we prevent these crashes from happening in our rural areas, um, and, and when we cannot, when we cannot prevent them from happening, what are we doing to then help that person still make it home? Um, and so I think that's a, maybe a good segue into our next discussions um, about emergency services and, and how we can um, think very clearly about what the challenges are in our rural areas um, and how do we start closing some of these gaps in survivability. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Morris, that was wonderful. Uh, now we're gonna move into our conversation circle. For those of you who don't know me, I'm James DeSoto. I'm with the Center for Transportation Studies, and I am the Director of Program Development and Delivery. I'd like to welcome uh, Dr. Mike uh, Piskarich to the circle as well. Uh, he joins us from the Translational Center for Resuscitative Trauma Care at the University of Minnesota. So if you wouldn't mind coming in. All right. Uh, nice to meet you all. Uh, this has been a uh, really interesting and insightful thing, including Valerie's presentations and our demographics earlier. Um, it really aligns with a lot of what I do. My other role, besides being a translational researcher focused on trauma care, is I'm an emergency physician at Hennepin Healthcare. Uh, worked last evening. Um, and so a lot of the issues you were talking about with transport, uh, particularly of marginalized communities, we see the effects of this really broadly. And then um, when we get out to rural communities, we've got patients being transported in from all around the state to our trauma center. And uh, you know, so we deal with a lot of these issues. Um, specifically uh, in regard to Nicole's presentation, you know, once these patients are injured, like our focus in the uh, Translational Trauma Research Center is trying to find ways from the point of injury to improve care. These are things like EMS transport and training and a lot of things Nicole opened with in her opening slide. And that's what we do because we're clinicians and that's what we know. But I can tell you, I think just about anybody who works in the trauma space for any particular period of time very quickly moves into prevention. And so the importance of this work is like really can't be understated because once these injuries happen in frail patient populations or older patient populations, the outcomes are just really poor. And then you throw in the rural piece and the mortality rate is markedly higher. Um, which kind of bridges me a little bit maybe into my first question. I got a few and, you know, happy to op open it up and things like that. But my first question for Nicole, in terms of the messaging and things like that, uh, kind of two related pieces. One, you talked about different um, urban, suburban, rural areas responding to different messages differently. Uh, one question I had, and then I'll, I'll just give you the other question to see if there's any overlap or not, is did you look at all at kind of the age of the recipients and which messages tended to land? Um, and relatedly, in terms of, uh, you mentioned out leading with the benefits. And uh, I guess one of my questions with that, you mentioned the cost, which you know may land with city planners and things like that, but in terms of community members, I don't know because I don't do this work in terms of kind of the benefits of prevention of injury. Do you talk about what this looks like at all? Like what does being injured in an MVC in a rural area, particularly as an older patient, I mean, it's real easy to say, oh, you know, there's a risk of dying and that's very abstract and a lot of people are actually kind of okay with that, but what they really don't want is like you get a spinal injury or a bunch of fractures and then you know you have to go back home and you can't walk and you have nobody support you and you're back and forth to the hospital and you're going to rehab I mean that's the one the one that most people are like well, I'd rather just die um, those messages is that 
helpful, or does that just make things worse and cause people to shut down? So kind of related, kind of not, but I'm just kind of curious your thoughts on those. Uh, that's a great question. Um, so, uh, you know, I don't remember what the age uh, thing was. It, it must not have been very predictive. If I, I feel like there was something about that there was maybe an interaction of rurality and age that that we saw some of the younger rural people being more resistant, and, and it was reversed in, in our urban areas. Um, we did see education as being predictive of being more accepting. I think a lot of this really comes down to some, some kind of um, trends that have been underway and maybe uh, sort of accelerated re recently about sort of just um, rejection of kind of intellectualism or, or, or academia or government agencies. And, and so I think that... that that was certainly a problem that we were seeing some of these trends of who did they want to hear from and, and who did they not want to hear from. Um, you know, I think that the the fungibility sort of of safety culture is really important to think about. And, and so um, one of the things that was nice about the the thing with art was he was talking about like his kid and, and so sort of connecting to family. Um, and I and I have heard some really powerful um, talks in the past about doing this, about not so much death, because I think, again, there, there's some sort of paternalism that goes into the government telling me how I'm going to behave. You certainly see this with motorcycle riders, where, you know, it's sort of my God-given right to die in a, in a motorcycle crash, and the government shouldn't stop that from happening. Um, and I heard a really powerful talk from, from a, a nurse at Hennepin uh, once, and she said she was at church, and a guy had come in, and he was like, did you see my motorcycle out there? And she was like, oh, well, I wasn't going to bring it up. But yes, I did. I saw it when I came in. And I noticed there wasn't a helmet. And he said, you know, whatever, right? And she goes, oh, yeah, we have a term for that at the hospital. We call those donor cycles. And, you know, his face kind of falls flat. And then she points to his daughter, who she knows. And she says, you see your daughter over there? If you get in a crash, you might not die but she's not going to college. She's gonna be taking care of you. She's gonna be feeding you. And he's just like, what? So she said the following week, he comes back and, and he's like, I could not get that term donor cycle out of my head. And I started wearing my helmet, right? So, so that was like very powerful. It gives me chills every time I retell that story. Um, but how do you scale that, right? She knew him. She knew the daughter, right? So how do we make that same connection? Um, Nick Ward has done some work uh, like this, I think, in the Philippines, where they did some public messaging uh, for young male motorcycle riders, um, where they, they're like, what do young males uh, value? their looks and their independence. And so they showed a very handsome motorcycle rider, young motorcycle rider, and then they showed him being spoon-fed by his mother. Very mangled, right? Um, does that work? You know, I don't know. But um, I, I do think we need to, to connect with people in ways that they, yeah, they're, they're, not, they're not saying like life or death. They're seeing what that terrible middle ground might be. Hi, Nicole, thank you. Um, I work for the Memory Keepers Medical Discovery Team. I'm a Northwest community-based researcher. And so this is, I work on the health side and my di dietitian, but this is awesome. Um, I guess my question is, I, I think this is great, and I'm a big fan of roundabouts. As someone that drives around, you know, Becker County, Hubbard County, Beltrami County, how do I even know, like, how can I be an advocate for this as far as, like, knowing where a J turn turn is appropriate because I think about driving even back home today and it's like oh I don't I couldn't tell you on my drive where mm -hmm. that is most appropriate because it's just so automatic um, and even thinking about from an aging perspective you know how do we then uh, like encourage these changes into like a whole new set of driving and um, encouraging it as a way to keep independence and not just a, a complete change so. Yeah, I guess how would someone, like, how do you know, like, a lay person, how would I know even where to be advocating for those? It's mm. a great question. I, I, I may leave this to maybe some of the engineers in the room because I don't, I can't really make those decisions about, you know, where it's a good application. But I will say, you know, I'll, I'll be at a neighborhood barbecue or something and, and somebody finds out that I'm, you know, do what I do. And, and it, almost always it's like, what do you think about roundabouts? <laughs> and, and, and I think they expect be, because they're like, 
you know, I think they're insane and, and I think you're about ready to agree with me. And, and then I, I very, just very thoughtfully try to walk through why I understand they might think they're bad or they might not like them, but why they're actually really good. Um, so I think, you know, anytime you can have those conversations and, and just really kind of validate people that, yes, their experiences are a part of it because, you know, sometimes a, a traffic treatment might lead to a small uptick in property damage only crashes and, and sort of, you know, and that's a hard thing for people to accept. Um, and, but I think, you know, continuing um, to have those conversations when, whenever people are kind of questioning these things of, of validating and then trying to, to shift them a little bit is really important. Um, there's only about 50 to 60 of these intersections in Minnesota right now. So I think it is hard to kind of come across these things. Um, but more and more, I think they, they will become more and more pervasive. So, um, you know, you'll, you'll probably have lots of opportunities to talk about them as we go forward. Kelsey, don't go anywhere. I have an idea for you. Okay. Well, maybe you don't have to respond to it, but my name is Stephanie Malinoff. I work at the Center for Transportation Studies, and I also work very closely with our state's Toward Zero Deaths program. And throughout the state, we have the pro we have regional coordinators in each of I think there's eight different regions throughout the state. And so I can't remember exactly what counties you said you were and which uh, which region you would align with, but I would be happy to follow up with you offline afterward oh, and connect awesome. you with the regional coordinator in that state who is connected to the MnDOT district engineer in that area who will be very familiar with the regionality and the intersections and can connect with the right people on the data and where those kinds of um, opportunities may exist. But I think it's a network that you might find really valuable to connect and yeah. tap with in some of your other work. And the other thing I think about is, I don't know if you're connected with the Statewide Trauma Advisory Council, but there are regional stacks as well. And so um, they they would be able to get connected through that reason, regional TG, TZD approach as well. That would be awesome. Hi, my name is Karen Neinstead. I'm a librarian with MnDOT, and I just wanted to piggyback on what Steph said. Um, another way that people reach out, at least for library services, as far as getting the message out to the community is through their AARP, the local driving groups. Um, they often have members of the community doing the instructing for that, and they often reach out and get, you know, some of them still use VHS, thank you very much. So they bring in, they roll in their AV cart with their VCRs, and they play old, you know, as far as driving roundabouts, flashing yellow arrows, any of these newer technologies that we are used to seeing in our daily work, for the first time, these rural elderly communities have never seen them. They don't know how to drive them. So one way is to just reach out to like the AARP coordinators or some of the local community ed programs that do some of the, the newer defensive driving and the renewals and all of that. So. So. Mike, I have a question for you, you know, because one of the things I, I worry about when, when we start talking about like preventing these crashes is the reality is we're not going to. I mean, you know, we hope we can and, and we try and we do, but we don't prevent all of them. And so, you know, are, are we devoting maybe too much resources to that and ignoring the fact that we won't prevent them and then we're not saving people? Like, what can we be doing? What should we be doing to, to reduce mortality while we're not able to get our crashes to zero? Yeah, so that's uh, a great question and, you know, kind of the whole point of kind of the center is trying to like dig down into those kind of issues. Um, this has been, we have our hypotheses um, in terms of where we think the money's at, um, but I can tell you this has been an ignored problem on the national level essentially forever. Um, and so this is, there's very, very little data. Um, so we are currently working to merge a number of different data sets that we have access to within the state between uh, the trauma centers, um, the uh, EMS regulatory board, and some other data sets that all exist within the state government trying to merge them to get a better understanding of some of the factors at play. Some of the issues that come up that I see as challenges for this group to brainstorm are some of the following. So one, you mentioned, an accident happening and not even knowing about it. Now, I think with some of the newer computer systems that are embedded into some of these cars and crash detection systems and things like that, they may help a little bit. Um, I expect that'll be some, but as you guys well know, there are areas that don't really have 
cell phone and GPS coverage, and um, so they may or may not be functional. Um, so that's challenge number one. Challenge number two is getting, or even once the recognition happens, getting EMS there. The way EMS is staffed in this country is um, it's kind of half owned by Department of Public Safety and half owned by kind of health insurance, Medicare, Medicaid, and nobody really wants it. So it's paid very poorly, and so as a result, uh, EMS providers are reimbursed not particularly well. Most EMS providers don't do this as a career, but either as stepping stones, particularly in urban areas, to other healthcare professions. So we lose many well-trained, highly skilled individuals to go into other things, which is great for them individually, but bad for the system. Um, but in rural communities, it's more often done as a form of service. They do it because it's taking care of their community. Um, as a result, a lot of them are volunteers. They're not career folks. Um, and then, just like everything else, they're an aging patient population, their backs are going out, and everything else uh, is causing problems. Um, that is a challenge. So there's major workforce problems with EMS. Getting further into the transportation issues is looking at the distribution of, we mentioned rural hospital closures, hospitals within the state, um, there are areas in the state where it's, Nicole alluded to this, we generally want to treat patients with trauma within an hour, an hour of their injury. Well, depending on where you get injured, you mentioned deadhead miles previously. What may happen is you got a volunteer who's out for dinner with their family, they get a call, they have to drive in to get the ambulance, they have to drive an hour of the ambulance to get out, then they have to drive back to a hospital, that hospital may not be equipped, then from that hospital they may need to go someplace else. Mind you, if you're counting, crossing county lines, some of these rural areas may only have two ambulances in the entire county. If one ambulance leaves to come down to Hennepin for a major trauma, um, that leaves one ambulance to cover the rest of the county for all medical emergencies. Um, so, and then they also don't get paid for their dead head miles getting back to the county. So sometimes what will happen then is they'll go to the county lines, they'll rendezvous with another, and then they'll rendezvous with another, and then they'll, so um, Chris Culling, who's a trauma surgeon up in Duluth who we work with, documented this, looking at their head injured patients, a number of their patients uh, had four different sets of EMS providers before they ever ended up at, the, at Duluth in the trauma center. Some of this can be obviated with helicopter launches. Uh, however, we're in Minnesota, it's winter time, you can't always fly. Um, helicopter, particularly medical helicopter, uh, there are deaths um, that occur by transport. Uh, one of my mentors, uh, who was a physician in Wisconsin, died in a helicopter crash going to get a patient. So these things aren't without risk either. So there's no great, great solutions here. We've got long transport times. We've got an undertrained workforce. Um, we need to probably address all of these things. What is the, the low-hanging fruit here? Um, I, I, right now, we are still trying to understand the scope of a problem. So I, I've laid out a lot of the challenges here. Um, in terms of what we can do, you know, are there uh, opportunities for, uh, you know, road design and faster transports? Are there, you know, opportunities for uh, making sure that we can get in and have helicopter landing spaces? Um, you know, that, that starts getting outside of my area of expertise and where the low-hanging fruit is, I think we're just starting to um, touch on that. I will also just throw out here, as we're doing this, we're always looking for new partners. So if there's people who are interested in trying to tackle some of these issues as they apply to the intersection of trauma and rural health, uh, we are happy to engage with other folks, facilitate uh, connections, and, and help where we can as well. Paul, I think you might be our last question. All right, sounds good. Uh, Paul Morris with SRF Consulting Group. I'm a transportation engineer, so in the context of this, my role would typically be to identify those high-risk intersections where this might be a treatment and then to you know, propose that as an engineering solution and potentially sell it to the community. Uh, so one, just want to thank Dr. Morris for um, 
this research because I think it's so key. You know, we there's obviously a lot of research that goes into a lot of the engineering solutions in terms of their effectiveness and everything. And so I think to bring that same uh, rigor to our public engagement techniques is really key here. Um, however, one of the things I think is a challenge is, you know, obviously delivering engineering projects or developing projects is, is a constrained um, activity as well. Um, you know, whether it's the budgets and the, the human resources that go into it. And so we heard a lot, a lot of effective techniques, the testimonials, videos, driving simulations. I've, you know, I've been in enough of those public meetings where we're trying to sell the solution. And I'm like, yeah, if we had a driving simulator there and, you know, people giving testimonials and all that stuff, like we could totally, you know, convince the, those populations. But, you know, we're not at a point you know, either with the project resources or the people to kind of deliver that. And then also the scope of the problem. You say there's only less than 100 J turns in the whole state, but there's probably a need for several hundred or thousand. How are we gonna, you know, how do we, what's like the, the business case or how can we, you know, kind of uh, quantify some return on investment to bring that, uh, the, the engagement side? So, um I, I do think that, you know, we, we need to be working together to create more of these testimonials. And and while I think, you know, having someone like Trooper Delwu there in person, I don't think they need to be in person, right? So just playing these videos it can be really powerful. And so um, at, at not a lot of cost, I don't think the production costs are, are very high. Um, we do need to be working with community partners, though, to identify who those people are. Um, and, and I certainly know that there are gaps. We, we need... Um, you know, even though, uh, again, Boat Guy is, is pretty um, pervasive um, and, and sort of it's his acceptance among people, I still heard, particularly from those young rural drivers, that they wanted to hear from a, an actual truck driver. Or they wanted to hear from an actual farmer. And we didn't have that. Um, and so, you know, if, if you know people, you know, would you be willing to do this? I mean, they really have to put themselves out there. But I think um, getting more of those... Um, you know, testimonials from people of roundabouts and J-turns and diverging diamonds, you know, whatever it is, I think we could have a stockpile of them and they could just be used again and again and again. Certainly I will ha give you all of those videos if you want to use them. Um, uh, but I think that's the, that's probably the first step. Um, you know, but the driving simulators, I think that will take some big investment. Um, and, and they're not without risk because um, you know, if, if you have a bad go, not everybody does well in a driving simulator. And so if they, if they, if they go off the road, are they going to sort of attribute that to being the simulator? Are they going to attribute it? So um, we do like this 360 video thing, and I think that is another potential thing that we could scale pretty cheaply. Um, you know, you just need people with the expertise on how to create those 360 videos and put them into a format that are viewable. Um, so, so that's my recommendation is I, th I think this is scalable, probably not at the driving simulator level, but I, th I think the videos are pretty powerful. Yeah. Well, thank you. Discussion. Well, we had a, a small but mighty crowd today, so thank you all so much for your participation and a great, great conversation and presentation. So let's Thank again Valerie and Carrie and Nicole and Mike for their involvement today.